You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. This is the Daniel Monday Night Community Show on demand through YouTube. Thank you very much for choosing to listen to us through this method. If you'd like to keep up to date with when I add new interviews, then subscribe to this channel. This is the Monday Night Community Show with me, Daniel, on 95.6 BRFM, the island's very own truly local community radio station. And it's time now for a very special evening, actually. You may remember a couple of months ago, we spoke to uh, Patrick Wright all about Juve Johnson. And uh, he, of course, is uh, a very well-known German writer who lived on the island um, for a period, I think, of around 10 years during the uh, 70s and 80s. And uh, basically, the big fish have gone on to perform some of the writings he did while he lived here on the Isle of Sheppey. And we've been very lucky enough to work with them and record them performing those writings. First of all, I spoke to Patrick and uh, Chris, of course, from uh, Big Fish to introduce to you in a little bit more detail about what you're going to hear and uh, all about the project and what they've been doing as well. Uwe Janssen, well, he's, he's, a, he's a really important German writer. That's who he is. He's a, a writer who grew up in East Germany on the Baltic coast, an area called Mecklenburg. And um, he was uh, somebody who in his youth held out high hopes for East German socialism because he thought it was what it was the answer to Nazism. So he was in that generation who thought this was the, the best alternative. And what happened was as he grew up and went to university, he got into more and more difficulty with the regime and he started writing and the East German regime didn't want to publish what he wrote, so he moved west. And by the time he was in his mid-20s, 24, 25, he'd written a book called Speculations About Jacob, which was an enormous novel in West Germany. So he was a very famous writer as a young man. He wrote three books dealing with the division of Germany, and he got more and more fed up with the arguments about politics. He was quite a political thinker, but he got he was accused of being a Stalinist on one side, he's accused of being a sort of capitalist on the other. And these very tiresome so so basically by the by the time he was in his early thirties, Johnson was he had been living in West Berlin a lot. He lived a bit in Rome. He'd spent two years in New York um, where he started writing this huge book, four volumes, called Anniversaries, which is the story of a woman called Gesina Crespal and her daughter. And they lived through the year 1968 in New York, but they're reviewing all the history of Germany since the beginning of fascism, really, the early after the First World War. So it's a kind of family chronicle written about this very extreme political experience. And he got fed up with Berlin. So what he did one day was he borrowed a pile of money from a friend of his, and he moved to England to look for a house, and he bought a house on Marine Parade in Sheerness. So that's what happened. And he lived here for 10 years with his wife and daughter. Um, they lived always in 26 Marine Parade, and he continually failed to finish this huge novel until the very end of that period. And he, he would do other things. He did quite a lot of writing, but he also got into drinking. He was a terrible drinker, really, from the start. And um, he was in the Napier, he was in the Sea View. He talked often about wanting to write a book about the people of Sheppey. He even came up with a title. He said he was going to write a book of island stories. But, of course, he never did much of it. He never finished it, because what happened to him was he died aged 49 in 1984. So it was a disastrous end. He died of drink and illness and chaotic, and his wife threw his wife out of the house. So really a destructive story in some ways. But his writing was always brilliant, and it remained so in Sheerness. So what, what we found was there's about... There's a whole book's worth of sort of descriptions of Sheerness in stories, in newspaper articles, and in letters, especially in letters he sent to friends. So what we've done is we've translated these... Um, and I'm now trying to find a way of publishing them. But I also thought it would be just great if we could bring them back to Sheppey, because no, nobody here has ever really known much about him. People knew he was here, but nobody knew really who he was, or, and no, nothing was known about what his descriptions of Sheppey were like. So Chris and I got together, 
And we thought, why don't we do? A, why don't we start doing some readings? And that's actually where we are, isn't it? And that's about it. Absolutely. Yes. So we had a we had a very nice evening in the little theatre a couple of months ago, in which we first tried them out. And so what we're doing here is giving you performances by Big Fish and Friends, various local people, some of whom I'm sure your listeners will recognise, who have taken these texts up and are going to read some of them now. And of course we've been doing it here in the Napier, which is hopefully relevant as well. We're in the Napier, which is one of the two bars Johnson spent a lot of time in. And what happened here was nobody could say his name, because it's spelled U-W-E. And I always say the way to spell it is to use the word Hoover and not the H off because it's Uva or Uve. And nobody can pronounce it. So what he used to do is he used to go around and say, call me Charles. So he's got this other life as Charles. And Charles or Charlie has all these friends in the pub. And the, these are ordinary Sheppy folk. I mean, they're the people of Sheerness who are struggling to get by. They're still living with the, the collapse of the dockyard, the lack of employment. They're people of this sort. And he, being an East German, he's at home with this world. He's not, you know, he's not interested in polite, smart, respectable life. He's completely bored by it. So, and he has no experience of it. So he becomes very, very friendly with these people who... You know, most people in London would think of as ruffians and riffraff. And, or I'm, maybe I'm exaggerating, but you know, the, you know the problem I'm describing. So he had an absolutely close engagement with these people. And he wrote about them in a sort of spirit of tribute. He, 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 li- he really liked the way they thought. He liked their immediacy. He liked their spontaneousness. He liked the fact that they were outcast. He loved the way they looked after themselves. They looked after each other. They were people for whom... The state offered very little, except the police knocking on the door, hassling them. And there was no money, and the welfare state was always struggling. But they had this wonderful way of seeing to one another. He really liked that. So these are the sorts of things we've, we've found in these texts. So I bet it's been good to work with Chris, because it's almost, uh, I suppose, modern local people reading those stories that he captured from local people of another era. Yeah, no, it's exactly that. We, I mean, we are a group of community uh, people who act a little bit um, about the history of the Isle of Sheppey. I live uh, 61 Marine Parade, so it's just down the road from where Uva Johnson used to live. And um, I've always seen a little plaque on his house and been intrigued. So it's been absolutely wonderful meeting Patrick and actually learning the real story behind the house and um, discovering all these fabulous readings, which I hope that uh, the big fish readers have, have done a little bit of justice to. Yeah, no, it's, well, that's absolutely great for me. And what I've found is by having the, this thing going with these people that have sort of come into the big fish performances, is that, you know, I'm really close to the world that Johnson is describing. We, we've, we find people come up and say, oh, yeah, if Johnson writes a story about somebody breaking into the fruit machine in a pub, he says, yeah, I used to own that fruit machine. Or if he describes going to have a picture, an avant-garde picture by a very famous German painter to photographed for a catalogue in Germany, and the photographer who thought it was a piece of absolute rubbish, he's still here, you know. So what I found through this project is all sorts of connections with the memory of, the, of his time here, which, it, of course, it gives me much more to to write about when I pull together the final story. So it's been lots of gain for me as well. And we've certainly found it fascinating. Uh, for instance, the description of a, a train journey down from London to, to Sheerness. You could have done it yesterday. It's exactly the same. The times are exactly the same and everything. Um, so there's so much which hasn't changed on the island. There are lots of things that have, but all that hasn't changed, and everybody remembers the steelworks and the cars being crushed. Um, obviously, it's sad now because the steelworks has closed down just in the last um, about three years, I believe. Um, but everything else is so reminiscent, and, uh, and for a lot of older people, it's very no- nostalgic as well. And actually coming into the Napier to read them out has been fabulous. Yeah, drinking in the Napier, that would be that would be a subtitle <laughs> for in the Napier. what this is all about. Drinking and talking. I mean then the final thing for me, I mean, because you know, I have a job in London, so I come down to Sheerness and 
you know, it's inevitable not to see this town has got its difficulties. You know, it's struggling to find a way of being in the world, so to speak. But the thing that is great about Johnson is that he doesn't describe the people here in negative terms. He's, there are hundreds of descriptions of Sheerness as a place full of people who are a bit inadequate or can't cope. I mean, it's a sort of standard joke that people who live on Sheppey have to put up with. But Johnson has no interest in that whatsoever. What he sees is these really triumphant people who know how to live well on very modest means, you know, and these are, as far as he's concerned, these are the people who matter, and that's what he does. So he, he's every piece he writes is sort of elevating them. It's 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 the tributes, the, the sort of salutes, you know. Reconnaissances, letter to Max Frisch, the 18th of December, 1974. I am reliably informed about a place where it seems to be no coincidence that a cul-de-sac in this country is not called that, or a dead-end street, but a blind alley. That would already be something. I'm sure of it in Sheerness on the Isle of Sheppey. There's more than enough you could hold against this island, and such ample objections are infallibly expressed to me. It is, they say, really not at all lovely there. I admit that with surprisingly little resistance, since it's hard to dispute that on either side of the train, the fruit orchards and rye fields with their charming fringe of foliage disappear as soon as the bridge over the swale so much as comes into view. The chalky, swampy fields on the island are really not at all Garden of England, if indeed any tourist can stand this smug catchphrase any longer than from Dover to Canterbury. No. It is not pretty, but is that why we've come? It's also true that even the Romans did not build villas there. Expeditions to the island on their part have only been alleged, never proven. It is true that Sheerness, population approximately 14,000, is clearly fringed all around with bathers who can afford only such pebbly beaches or else prefer to content themselves with trade and consumption along the stone seawall promenade. Most of them in wheelchairs, an unjust voice reiterates. Sheerness does not in fact lie on sea, as it tries officially to maintain. The north bank of the Thames continues to the opposite shore. One has to turn one's head slightly to the right if one wants to glimpse the open ocean. My opponents concede this as well as the two hours by train to Victoria Station and the three to Heathrow. But it's not pretty, they say, and even less so during the other nine months. I could have taken them unawares by converting that time span into an argument in favour, but I refrain. The life of this community is fundamentally and then really and truly influenced by a steel mill. There are industrial conflicts with the workforce. A retiree before the court over the theft of foodstuffs from the supermarket accepts his punishment and states in his closing statement that it... Government payments leave him not too well off. On the other hand, the municipal park on the Broadway. A house on Marine Parade comparable in construction to New York's brownstones, but built around 1915, and likewise standing in a tight row, but cleaned and painted white, constitutes one helpful argument in favour. It has an enlarged basement under the front steps, lower than street level, with at best a view of strangely cropped passers-by and cars out the front. There's a garden in the back, but for someone who wants to house a complete office there and does not want to look out of the window while he's writing, that doesn't matter. The story to which the front steps leads up faces north, looking out at the railing of the promenade with a thin stripe of sea, river, above it, and then nothing but sky. You can eat there. The view while you're cooking over the walled-in gardens at the distant rear facades of other buildings won't bother you too much. So, there's that. The next floor up practically juts out over the water. So, there's that. 
and by the time we get to the fourth floor with the two mansard roof rooms facing north and south, it has already been decided that I will be barred from making use of them. If. And so, this if has commenced. Brokers telephone, solicitors prepare contracts to exchange with one another. Our cheque, deposited with Mr Borneye, will easily cover everything, including repair costs. The current occupant has no objection to German successors. Another applicant is rejected and remembered without regret, since he once planned to turn a building like this one into a chest of drawers with mini apartments. The completion of sale should be possible by August the 20th. What could happen in the meantime? Of course, some insurmountable obstacle could come up. So we are told, assured, admolished, congratulated, and yet it has little power over the leavening of suspicion and hope in the background of our plan. There is a room in this house that we hope you might care to make use of. We will send you a telegram as soon as you may be certain of its availability. The Esplanade in front of the house. Letter to Hannah Arendt, the 8th of March, 1975. Here... I am speaking only of myself, and yet it may be not merely egotistical if I describe to you some views to be seen over the course of a few afternoon hours, views, namely, out of the window, and I wish you could have seen them. The two of us, next to each other, right in front of the house, where the poorer folks from London enjoy disporting themselves on a Sunday like this one as tourists. By the sea, visible only from the waist up to me and my dear wife, Mrs Let's Not Discuss It, and yet still a valuable warning about the lack of or taste in leisure attire. Following them come the waves of the River Thames, sea-like here, beating against the stones, as high or as low as the Royal Geographical Tidal Institute's calendar permits them to. For an ignorant observer, such as myself, they are merely bright white, a long way out, a little dirty looking, but choppy in any case. The last third of my visual field, though, is as blue as blue can be, magnificently changeable, from pale to grey to strapping within this colour. Within and atop this blue, what is there to say to a lady from Königsberg? Bathers in various stages of suffering from sunburn, Boats with sails in fashionable colourations, some of them even classified, and many of them well suited to offer me certain memories, silent but critical pertaining to the process of jibing. People paddling, those who let themselves be brought hither and thither by petrol engines, And, on the horizon, where cartography would suggest that we should be able to detect the south coast of Essex, merely a difference, not a line, a smudge between water and sky that educated people label as a horizon and which is therefore mine. And I've almost forgotten to admit to you the rude British petroleum oil tanker that just now went pitching from right to left, from east to west, across the window, probably because I believe I share your opinion of such objects in one's field of view. Letter to Alice and Dorothy Henson, 13th of January, 1976. By now I know more about Sheerness than I can say all at once. It is located on the northwest corner of the Isle of Sheppey. It should seem, by the dedication of the name, that this land was long since greatly esteemed for the number of its sheep and for the finesse of the fleece, written in Perambulations of Kent, 1570. 
The Romans already indicated this land on their maps for the general staff as the island of Ovinium. And its industries include a seal mill, a shirt factory, and a manufacturing plant for electronic components, rather than a tannery or a furery. Sheerness Docks, founded on August the 18th, 1665, on which date Charles II visited this corner of the world, and in the company of, among others, Ministry of the Navy, Samuel Pepys, who wrote about the event in his diary. To Sheerness, where we walked up and down, laying out the ground to be taken in for a yard to lay provisions for cleaning and repairing of ships, and a most proper place it is for the purpose. The port was then expanded into a real fortress, for the Dutch were growing insolent again, and on June the 10th, 1667, around five in the afternoon, they arrived with their cannons and occupied the island. The damage done to the English at this island was estimated at more than four tonne of gold. It is beautiful and a fruitful island. Sheerness was abandoned as a military port for the Navy some years ago, but it soon pulled itself together. Recently, with a twice-daily car and passenger, passenger ferry to Vlissingen, which we, however, refer to as Flushing, because when in Rome. We would like to point out the North Sea and the coastal cliff of Minster, and definitely Minster Abbey on its mountain. First settled, or at least attested, in 660 as a monastery for women, because Sexburger, the daughter of King Ethelbald, so wished it. Other than that, there is mostly fenced-in pasture land outside the town, mostly flat and almost treeless, for the dockyards have swallowed up the woodlands in the past three centuries. Sheerness, population approximately 15,000, is the shopping centre for the island, population 30,000 in total, or thereabouts. So both the main streets are jam-packed during the day, except for Sundays, and today, since Wednesday is early closing day. One of these streets runs east from the train station, interrupted by a small square with a clock tower on it that the male youth have to climb up on New Year's Eve because that's how it's always been. The Broadway runs off from there and the closer it gets to the line of the shore, the fewer shops there are and then its name changes. To Marine Parade. Description of the route, a letter to Fritz J. Reddits on the 4th of May 1977. Now I will tell you how to get to Sheerness. First of all, you have to book a hotel in London, for there is not a single one on the island. Herr Bucarius would recommend Browns on Dover Street. Faulkner stayed there too. Then you will want to get to Victoria Station. You can ask the hotel to call you a taxi, or you could also walk south down Dover Street to Piccadilly. Then turn right, and keep going until the entrance of the Green Park Underground Station presents itself. There, take a southbound train on the Victoria Line, and get off at the next stop, which is Victoria Station. Where you see the word tickets, go and stand, nice and polite, in the line with the others and ask, when you get to the front, for a day return to Sheerness on Sea. Costs a pretty penny. Now look at the large announcement board and find the trains to Ramsgate or Dover. They depart twice an hour, so you will be able to find one. After an hour's travel, more or less, please transfer to Sittingbourne. The branch line to Sheerness leaves from the opposite track. Another 17 minutes. The last train from Sheerness to London leaves a little after 10pm. If you let me know by phone 07956 2931 which train you are taking from Victoria, I'll come and fetch you. Otherwise, please cross the street in front of the Sheerness train station and walk towards the notice board with the town map on it that you will have long noticed. Diagonally across from you, next to the phone booths. Then all you have to do is go right onto the high street, then left along the Broadway until it turns into Marine Parade. It's number 26. You'll have to knock because the bell is broken. So we're ready. 
There sit the guys. Letter to Erica Clem, 3rd of November, 1975. Now I would like to tell you the story of 15 minutes at the sea view. There sit the guys, where they've been jabbering away for the past 45 minutes already. Someone died. Well, it's a sign. Hard to say what it means. It came in disguise, or, for instance, the butcher at the halfway co-op. Filling in for the regular bloke, who decided after a week, at 2.30 on a Saturday, to make off with the week's takings. He was just thumbing his nose at the negligence of the main office and didn't even check if he'd done what he was supposed to do and deposited the day's earnings in the bank across the road. In which case he probably got the idea before Saturday, between two or three. Right you are then. And as for what will become of Mr So-and-so, they all give such staunch suggestions that none of them could be arraigned before the court. Now a couple comes in. That changes the scene. Unlike when a lady walks in, when the word bloody and all its various objects disappear from the conversation, this couple demands more than merely following conventional morals. They require, without even fully realising it, that we pay attention to them. The woman makes the couple, even if her companion does the ordering, a grapefruit for her, in small quantities, beer for himself in large quantities. She allows him to by coming up and standing inconspicuously next to him. In truth, at no point was she ever behind him. She is pregnant and feels it in her whole body. That's one thing. She already has to wear a dress that all but evens out the surface between her breasts and her belly. As she stands there, she holds her hands loosely on her belly. She relaxes. She has something to protect. She is so full of her condition, visibly happy, her happiness increasing with every breath she takes. She is young, but it's not about that. Her husband stands next to her. He's not a big talker, but there's no need for words now. She's here. That's another thing. She tells us the latest, and thanks to her, they will all be getting the key to their next home in a few days, or a day or three, even if the mortgage payments look to be terrible. But they have escaped the imposition of the borough council and rent collectors. She speaks softly, but as though she is the one being asked, and no one has any doubt that everything important has to come from her. The husband in his chubby stupor, acts almost sanctified. That is to say, idiotic in his well-being, wanting merely to multiply and perfect it as once by appearing with her and with which he takes credit for and knows redounds to her credit too. She is masterful, discussing contractor problems with us, accepting respectable commentary and suggestions. Everyone is modest, almost shy, In such a way are idols created. It is clear on the faces of the bachelors, young and old, what they think. Best of luck to you both. Hopefully you can pull it off. Don't worry about any envy on my account. Oh, if only I could be that young again. If I had been close to someone and she to me like that, I would have lived a full life. But none of this is spoken. But by a kind of osmosis, it is more real in the bar than anything else is. Even if Joe does have a damned clever way of rolling himself a cigarette. The two of them stood next to each other, looking straight ahead. Not at each other, and everyone knew that they knew, I'm with you and you are with me. We saw without scoffing that he reacts the way men do when she put her hand on the back of his neck. She reacts reacts the way that women do when she will later take her plate away because he's going to wash it up. And then their fingers touch each other's. He knows it, he sees it. She can see it in advance when she asks him to come with her. He already trembles in several parts of his body. It is no less affectionate 
and it comes from them both. She says, everything's fine, Ron. Ron, I'm all right. Cheerio, you all. Letter to his publisher in August 1982. The house to the west of this one. There is a saying in vogue here which runs, I'm all right, Jack, pull up the ladder. This Jack is the person in a safe boat who hangs out a rope ladder for his fellow shipwreckies. Once the latter is safe on board, he doesn't need to care who else is swimming down there in the cold misfortune, so he says, Fine with me, Jack. Have I told you, oh, many thanks for the herring, that the house to the west of this one, occupied up until now by a handicapped lady as quiet as the quietest of mice, was sold immediately after her decease to someone who wants to turn it into four apartments stuck one on top of the other. Now during this renovation and construction, I realised with both ears and nerves that the wall separating it from me is only one stone thick. When the man next door takes a break with his hammer, I can hear him cheerfully whistling. You never know when the next blow is coming. Everyone is painfully surprised. Who was it who said that no situation was so bad that it couldn't get even worse? That will come true in my case when people move in behind who enjoy a little upright piano playing, who deem loud ruckuses useful for the unfolding of their darling children's soul, who know how to use only one button on their boombox, the one for volume. All this is a perfunctory measure to prepare you for the possible eventuality of requesting a loan for the purpose of installing soundproofing panels. I have no doubt let fall a word at all about the inexorable polluting and impoverishment of the town of Sheerness. Now I'm obliged to add the fact impossible to make up that the officers of Southern Water intend to protect this grimy, insignificant locale by raising the flood wall even higher in front of this row of houses. Proceeding this undertaking must necessarily come the removal of the existing embankment with all its garages, storerooms and the concrete wall on top. That is a to and throwing of heavy machinery from excavators to the wading crane with its fat cement noggin. As a result, Southern Walter have sent representatives of a sworn surveyor's firm into every house to determine and record its architectural condition in anticipation of the claims they expect to result from the consequence of the demolition and reconstruction. In other words, we have to reckon with the chance of collapsing walls, likewise of cracking windows. I mention this all in no way expecting that it will make me feel better to complain, a hypothesis all too amply disproven but merely to discourage you for a time, say two years or so, from asking me if I, how I'm doing. You will know the answer already. Aggrieved. Oh, You're a German, published in De Zeit, the 3rd of February 1978. A stranger visits the Isle of Sheppey in the mouth of the Thames and goes for a walk there on the streets of the city of Sheerness-on-Sea. It is a small town. The residents know each other. How do they know he's a stranger? He buys a town map. He has to find his way round. He looks at buildings more than at people. He does not expect any conversations with acquaintances. He walks idly round on a work day. He is a visitor from elsewhere. Where might he be from? From the mainland? From London? From another country? So, he is an Englishman? Like the people from here? He belongs here? Or he might have come on the ferry from Holland? So he is a tourist, and tourists are welcome in Sheerness. When will the people of Sheerness know for sure? When he opens his mouth. The stranger keeps his mouth shut. 
He smiled when the man behind the counter handed him the map because the man behind the counter smiled. A friendly comment about the summer weather was spoken to him and he only nodded in agreement. Does he not speak English? He can get by in this language, but he knows where he's from. He has a German passport in his pocket. The war with Germans was 30 years ago now. It is over, but he thinks about this war. There was East Church Airfield on this island, which the Germans bombed. There are people who were killed in airstrikes, and these people will remain in the memories of the citizens of Sheerness. The Germans fired rockets at London, whose flight pass passed over this island. The residents of the island will remember these deadly arrows. This particular German was a child then, and his father was not in the German Air Force. He remains a German, one of the enemy. He does not expect to be greeted on Broadway in Sheerness. He is startled when a lady speaks to him because now he has to answer. She will recognise him as a German. She will turn away from him and that will be like a slap in the face. Excuse me, the lady says. He answers the way he has learned in school to answer. There are many words in the answer and one of them will sound German. But the woman's face remains friendly and expectant. She asks, is it you? In English, you can mean Sie or du. He hears the latter in the woman's voice. I am not who you think, madam, the German says, in the many words his school wanted him to say, thereby putting on display his whole nation's struggle with the English the sound. The woman looks at him, asking for something, and she says, if it's you, then your name's Charlie Baker, and you're at East Church Airfield. You know the year 1940, and then you had to go to Scotland, and I am. You know who I am. The stranger knows the year 1940, <clears throat> the year of the first bombs. In the woman's eyes, this German looks like someone who was 18 years old during the war and because he left her, he is supposed to come back. She doesn't believe in the six years the stranger spent then. She ignores his German accent because for her, he is one Charlie Baker. He looks like him, walks like him. She was a lovely girl 30 years ago and Charlie was a fool, since she's waited 30 years for him. Now the stranger has to tell her the truth, for Charlie and for himself. I'm so sorry, the woman says. You are a guest in our country, you're on holiday, and here I am, come up to you and disturb you. This isn't how we usually behave, stopping a stranger on the street. Please believe me, it's just... We had an airfield, East Church, and a young man worked there who looked like you. Can you forgive me? The German recalls only a few words when he says goodbye to Charlie Baker's girl, and they are the wrong words. <sighs> Some come back one day, she answers sadly, and politely says, Welcome to the Isle of Sheppey. Welcome to England. Consider yourself many times thanked. What I can offer you without damaging reputations or infringing upon the secrets of people in my everyday environment is a custom that everyone agrees on and complies with irrespective of person or day and very much to the benefit of their foreign temporary neighbour whose attention they thereby draw to proper manners. It is the way they have of thanking and of wanting to be thanked, and thanked they shall be. The first was the conductor in the bus through Herne Hill, 
who stood next to me and said, thank you, where I had expected tickets, tickets, so that I misheard him a while longer until it occurred to me that he was thanking me in advance for the money that I was about to give him for the bus ticket, at which point he moved on with a thank you that trailed off, slightly bewildered, since he felt a certain lack of human feeling in me that should have been expressed by me saying, thank you. That was the last time I failed to supply it. Whenever I purchase a railway ticket, as I occasionally do, the clerk behind the counter shows his gratitude with a thank you, the same way I acknowledge my indebtedness to him with a thank you. The ticket puncher takes my ticket with a thank you and since he tears off a piece of it which costs him a certain effort plus he is performing his duty and on top of that he gives me back a proof of ticket purchase he can be sure of receiving a thank you from my side. The inspector in London can see from the piece of cardboard held out to him that the bearer is entitled to a return trip as well and puts the seal of a thank you upon his examination. And since he did have to give or waste a whole glance at my travel document, I compensate him for this fraction of a second with a thank you. Whereupon... I turn to the passenger who has cleared his overseas suitcase from my path with an amiable, civilised, dispassionate and nonetheless heartfelt thank you. Sometimes a variation does occur in the train when a guard draws near with the cry, Tickets, please! But he's not selling them. He wants to see what has already been bought and he hands back every passenger's with an apologetic thank you, full of justified confidence that each and every one will confirm the continued validity of the social contract with a relieved and virtuous thank you. The man at the ticket barrier, furthermore, gives every one of the 63 evening returnees from adolescence up the courtesy of an individual thank you, provided that they hand over their tickets to him. If someone needs to pay a supplementary fare, which is due only at the moment when money and receipt change hands, in this case, as you might rightly expect, a twofold one from each side. Thank you. Diagonally across from my window to the left. Diagonally across from my window to the left, improbable as it may seem to you, begins a row of houses named Neptune Terrace and containing the Dolphin Cafe, where I get a hot meal of bacon and egg around noon, along with a few working men, gas meter readers, drivers, who can eat heartier meals than that because they are less fat than I am. A misfortune occurred there this weekend. The fifth crew manning the calf since I've been going there, a married couple with two developmentally disabled children, had to give up. They had tried hard. They wanted to make the establishment basically just a single, rather dingy room, more attractive with a fancy curtain over the shop window. For every single one of the eight tables they purchased new salt and pepper shakers, plastic, stainless steel looking and probably at least 90 pence each. They greeted every guest upon their entrance and also their departure. They noticed and remembered when someone regularly ordered the same thing but only rarely were more than seven of the 19 wobbly chairs occupied and when the family huddled together at a table during quarter of an hour spans without much of anything to do they seemed to be taking refuge with each other. There were probably fights from the stress too. One time, the woman, something of misfortune already in her unwieldy, misplaced port corpulence and her insistence on wearing black clothes, ran through the town in a state of excitement, in tears, out of control, 
past people and not even noticing one of our regular guests, me. They had placed their hopes on next summer and its tourists, but in vain. On Friday, she stacked the furniture crying and her awkwardly written note asked, asking to be excused for the early closing hung in the window. On Monday, a new family took over, their predecessors having vanished from the island into a void that I picture to myself as a bare, dark, expensive room in a slum, all because there was not enough money on one occasion for the £30 rent that someone in Gillingham has the right to rake in just because at some point in the past he had been able to buy the building. So that Charles writes down the good stuff too. Since the previous Friday had also turned to evening after some sunny weather, but most blasted through with a cold wind, we had gathered together in our male society, which some people also referred to as a beer department store due to the prices. For we had things to discuss, first the contents of this sentence, and second, whatever else came up. Charles came in, the foreigner. I've already told you about him, haven't I? Real name is something totally different, but who can pronounce German names like that? So we rebaptized him. Suits him pretty well by this point. Good evening, Charles. Good evening. As we expected, he sat down on the far left stall, which we keep for him, at least until seven. And since the evening papers for the Sherness and the Region was laid out for him there, as usual, he dutifully started reading. Windows broken in, TV stolen, gold watch for long years of service, until he noticed a sign hanging above the bar. Do not throw cigarettes on the floor as people leaving on their hands and knees will be burnt. We knew what was coming next. Charles pulled out his notebook and wrote it down. Embarrassing for him, but we're used to it. It's one of those phrases that gives memory trouble and Charles apparently can't let that happen in his line of work, whatever it is. Something to do with writing. Still, he finds it awkward to write in public, so he hurried to get it down and stick the notebook back into his pocket and so that we'd forget about it. That was when he finally realised that we were all talking at once, like wild men. Just cut them off. Cut their hands off. Chop them off. Yeah, right here at the wrist. Well, as a taxpayer, I represent the view. Right that... you are. They just live off the dole. Just don't want to work. I say chop them off for repeated offenders. Anyway, first time they should just break their arms under the doctor's supervision. By this point, Charlie had understood enough to realise that we were batting around a philosophical question, the ethics of the penal code, and he asked us what the nature of the crime was. We've been turned over, said one of the victims in an almost enthusiastic tone. They'd had a break in. They broke open the jukebox, the one-armed bandits, drank all the bottles. And the telephone? Did you report any calls to the phone company? What? What are you talking about, Charles? They could have called Yokohama while they were here. We could only shake our heads at that. Only Charles would think of something like that. That's just how he is. They were just amateurs, Charles. Young people out for a good time. I'm not saying anything about anyone specifically, but the boys knew the way around. One of them could be standing right here in the room with us. Damn right. I have my ideas, I'll tell you that. They took all the rum, all the martini, vodka, eggnog, but left the bottle of whiskey untouched. That tells me something. Ah, a clue. Someone who doesn't like whiskey. Chop his hand off. No. If they'd only have put the empty bottles back on the bar, they could have washed up a bit. That's the only thing I hold against them. But we are for chopping off breaking and other mistreatments of the offending thieving hands. Children, children. The publican finally said in a warning tone, the patriarch in full possession of his licensee's rights, but it was too late. Charles had already been given a whole lot of thought-provoking matters to take in. True, he acted like he was just reading his carefree way through the newspaper for the Isle of Sheppey and its surroundings, but we saw right through him. The truth was, he was trying to retain and remember everything. Want to bet that when he got back home, he wrote it all down? That was why we told him, 
quietly and casually of course our good wishes for Lady Di 2 for July the 29th namely or rather for the morning after the wedding night let her be in such a good mood that she says to the man in bed next to her in a sweet voice oh my royal highness dear do the poor get this so that Charles writes the good stuff down too because he is going to write a book about this island bear some days. How can you doubt it? He won't be able to help it. Just look at us. How we're put together. How we say whatever comes into our heads. Can't keep our mouths shut. And that was a big fish here on the Isle of Sheppey performing those writings by Juve Johnson and uh, I must say a big thank you to Chris Ree and all a big fish of course Patrick Wright and the translator Damien Searles <laughs>